Hello. I'll keep my introduction very short. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell a, a really borrowed joke. And if anyone gets the answer, they get a they get a prize. What's the difference between and this is a borrowed joke, so some of you may know, a scientist and a pizza. And what? Pizza? What's the difference between a scientist and a pizza? A pizza can feed a family of four. <laughs> Um, this evening is actually the 25th of these evening presentations, so thank you so much for being so ineffably and unlimitedly tolerant. <laughs> I, I must also say that it's now over 40 years since I first spoke as an intermicro, a fact which I find scrotum tighteningly <laughs> and, and I really think it's incredible to think back all that length of time. It does make me realize that if I stick around long enough and if the management here remain as open-hearted and tolerant as they've always been in the past, then I might even get to 50. And, and to, to have lectured over 50 years at a conference would be an extraordinary achievement, something I'd be very proud to do. Very nice to see some of you, like Robert and Arthur, returning after a gap of years. Also wonderful to see so many young people coming to this meeting. Yeah. This meeting is, is not the largest, but it's the most refined and the most selective. And there is not a person... How long have you been learning? There is, not, there is not a person anywhere in Intermicro who is not a shit hot microscopist. There is no dead wood. You can ask any question of anybody and you will almost certainly get an accurate answer. And today, we are going to look at the microscope in the context of foolishness, fraud, and misrepresentation. It's interesting how often these talks manage to follow one another. This afternoon, Jan mentioned fraud in microscopy. And before that, Ted mentioned how the microscope and the microscopic image isn't part of the school curriculum. Well, my talk humbly follows what they said. So this evening, we're going to look at censoring the cell and how the media have banished the microscope. I had a visit from uh, an assistant producer working on Richard Hammond's Invisible Worlds. He rang me up later to say, no, we won't actually be able to use you in the program. We're going to do it rather differently. But what they looked at was uh, the structure of the lotus leaf and how it manages to shed water. We saw the structure of the leaf under a microscope. We saw the back end of a spider and its spinnerets. And we saw this. An invisible world of hidden forces. And the machines in here allow engineering on a barely imaginable scale. For some of their work, they need Britain's most powerful microscope. What I'm going to try and do is etch the title of this series onto an area a hundred times narrower than the width of a single hair. Type in a visible worlds. <laughs> there it is. That's astonishing. Scientists are only now beginning to understand a snowflake. It's far too small for us to see normally, but these microscope shots show actual snowflakes that have formed a powerful bond. The world stops there. The eye of a needle held at arm's length is pretty much the limit of human vision. On each tiny toe, there are a dozen parallel ridges. Microscopic photography reveals that the surface transforms into hundreds of thousands of tiny hairs. At 
100,000 times magnification. Suddenly you can see that each of these half million hairs has itself split ends at the tip, which create even finer hairs. 10 million could fit on a pinhead. These are dust mites. One square meter of rug can contain as many as 100,000 of them. In tests, agar dishes placed 10 meters from a sneeze were infected. And they showed that the average sneeze contains millions of microorganisms. A universe of other creatures that we never see. Like the tardigrade. They're the size of a small grain of sand. And they're everywhere. The fresh leaf salad, drizzled with vinegar dressing, complete with a dash of the freeze-swimming vinegar eel. And then we come to the cheese course, dusted with a coating of cheese mites. You know that fine grey dust you can make out on older cheese? Well, that's the bits the mites leave behind when they're done. But it's not just our food that hosts a thriving microlife. Plankton. These tiny creatures, virtually invisible to us, are an entire universe of astonishing life forms. But their existence is vital to the existence of life on this planet. Now notice two things. Firstly, not a single living cell anywhere. The closest we got were technically rather incompetent pictures of tardigrades, which of course are multicellular, but not a single living cell anywhere in the picture. And hardly anything microscopic. Think of what it was. The, the surface of a leaf structure, mites, bugs, we looked at snowflakes. All of these specimens were in micrographia in 1665. And Hook also didn't look at truly microscopic stuff so much as he looked at familiar things in the dry form. And in essence, what we had is a repeat of micrographia. The range of specimens in this modern program is the same as in that book from the middle 1600s. And of real life and living cells, there was absolutely no sign um, and as a result, television misses out on everything. Uh, these are some of the, uh, the standard slides which are here in, in, in the teaching lab next door, which I just happened to film last year with my, my hand-held camera, because the silicious structures are so, so delicious. Gary and I went up onto the roof and we found a, a pond with some protozoa, and I just took those under phase. In fact, the soundtrack to this is of the class all chatting and laughing and joshing and teasing in the way that we do. But you, this just shows how easy and simple it is to grab these things wherever you happen to be. And if you, you click over to the uh, 40 times objective, then you can see the cilia and a good deal of the internal structure of these fascinating little organisms. They are not just uh, boring non-entities and routine non-televisual subjects. They are very, very exciting. Just watch the way, this is one of Dr. Big uh, pictures, just watch the way in which this wonderful euglena wormed its way around the habitat where it is, exploring. You can see all this inner structure working away that the chloroplasts, which of course uh, give it its, uh, its source of energy. Watch this wonderful euglena. Look at its, its sculptured surface and watch its eye as it turns around, any child could tell you that that's the front end, that's the eye, but this is in a single cell. Yet people who've never seen them still know exactly, instinctively, what it is that they are looking at and what it is that these things will do. I mean, these are such exquisite sights under the microscope, and yet they are simply banished from television. This is a wonderful sequence of this glorious, 
pretty organism. This is what people should be looking at. Just a bunch of eubloid algae under positive phase in a little limpid drop of pond water. If you turn on television and you have a man saying, oh, which side do I look at? A man saying, oh, is this a dollar sign? I thought it was a yen in an economics program. If you have a doctor, a medical program, and somebody saying, oh, the pancreas, I can never tell those away from the heart. It's embarrassing. <laughs> then in sport, if somebody said, this baseball bat is what is used for playing football. I mean, it is at that level of stupidity that these, that these commentaries are being given. And it only happens in this area of science. One doesn't blame the presenters. They are, basically speaking, reading out the script that they've been given. But in an era where we value knowledge, and in, in the era where bioscience is the leading science of all, it is criminal that the public are kept from this. And if there is anything any of you can do to encourage television people to look twice at what they produce, and to try, as Ted was saying today, to try and get youngsters to actually know this stuff is here, to abandon the tyranny of molecular biology, which has achieved such wonderful discoveries, but now dominates our thoughts. Until we can actually lay claim to the nature of life and the glory of the living cell, humanity will be impoverished. Other countries are very keen on showing it. In the West, we've abandoned it, and it is disgraceful that the media are ever allowed to get away with this dreadful crime against knowledge. Thank you all very much indeed.